Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 340 Climatology. I'm Dr. Zach Hilgendorf, and today we're going to be talking about natural climate drivers because we have now switched gears. We are no longer talking about the atmosphere. We're no longer talking about things like uh, conventional climate systems. We are talking about paleoclimates, climates that used to be, right? So we have to go to the Wayback Machine for this one. Because we think way back to the beginning, of course, I think this was lecture two, we talked about six global drivers of climate, latitude, land and water distribution, geographic position and prevailing winds, mountains and highlands, ocean currents, and pressure and wind systems. We have talked about these ad nauseum over the last number of weeks. Throughout this whole semester, we're in week 14. And we've talked about these systems and we know how they function and or at least have a good idea of how they function. But how do we know about past climates? And this is a really important one because how do we create this? If you remember from way back, this figure presents results from the Antarctic uh, EPICA Dome 2 or Dome C ice core showing development of temperature in, Ar in Antarctica and concentrations of atmospheric greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in blue, methane in red over the last 800,000 years. How do we get this? Because we weren't there with a thermometer 800,000 years ago. There has to be some way. And paleoclimate proxies, as we talked about and alluded to in way back in lecture two, are the way we do that. But first, we need to consider what naturally drives climate shifts through time. One of those changes in solar output. This is a 400 years of sunspot observations, uh, much more regular around the 1750s. But this is a way that we can look at sun or differences in solar output. Solar output is one of those things that drives insulation. And if you have more solar energy coming in, you've got more energy to work with. Your climates will be warmer to accommodate that thermodynamic equilibrium. What comes in has to go out. So We've got more coming in, more has to go out, but that's gonna to lead to a warmer earth. So these natural cycles and natural variations occur. Very famous, uh, the Milankovitch cycles kind of explain some of the variations in earth's orbit that drive these shifts in insulation incoming into the planet. A century ago, uh, Serbian scientist Milutin Milankovitch hypothesized the long-term collective effects of changes in earth's position relative to the sun are a strong driver of Earth's long-term climate and are responsible for triggering the beginning and end of glacial periods, ice ages. Specifically, he examined how variations in three types of Earth's orbital movements affect how much solar radiation or insulation reaches the top of Earth's atmosphere, as well as where this, the insulation reaches. These cyclical orbital movements, which became known as Milankovitch cycles, cause variations of up to 25% in the incoming insulation at Earth's mid-latitudes, so between about 30 and 60 degrees north and south. Milankovitch, and cycles, or Milankovitch cycles include the shape of Earth's orbit, known as uh, eccentricity, the angle Earth's axis is tilted with respect to Earth's orbital plane, known as obliquity, and the direction Earth's axis of rotation is pointed, known as precession. So it is the seasonality and location of insulation that impact the contrast between seasons, right? That's based off of these variations in eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. So here we can see eccentricity. Over time, the pull of gravity from our solar system's two largest giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, cause the shape of Earth's orbit to vary from nearly circular to slightly elliptical. We are not at a perfect circular orbit. We're at a slightly elliptical orbit. Eccentricity measures how much the shape of Earth's orbit departs from a perfect circle. Uh, the variations affect the distance between Earth and the Sun. When Earth's orbit is at its most elliptic, about 23% more incoming solar radiation reaches Earth at our planet's closest approach to the sun each year than does at its furthest departure from the sun. Currently, Earth's eccentricity is near its least elliptic, most circular, 
and is slowly decreasing in a cycle that spans about 100,000 years. The total change in global annual insulation due to the eccentricity cycle is very small. Because variations in Earth's eccentricity are fairly small, they're a relatively minor factor in annual seasonal climatic variations. So big things to note from this one uh, is that it changes Earth's orbit from nearly circular to slightly elliptical, and that cyclicity, or how often these cycles kind of culminate, is every 100,000 years. Obliquity, or axial tilt, is why Earth has seasons. Over the last million years, it's varied between 22.1 and 24.5. We typically think of this as a 23.5 degree tilt. That's what we've always talked about it in Geography 104. We used that when we were calculating noon sun angles back in the uh, insulation in the seasons labs. Um, the greater Earth's axial tilt angle, the more extreme our seasons are. As each hemisphere reaches or receives more solar radiation during its summer, when that hemisphere is tilted towards the sun and less during winter, when it's tilted away, changes to that tilt will have a greater impact on the amount of insulation coming in or not coming in. Larger tilt angles favor periods of deglaciation, the melting and retreat of glaciers and ice sheets. These effects aren't uniform globally. Higher latitudes receive a larger change in total solar radiation than areas closer to the equator. Currently, Earth is tilted uh, at about 23.4, not 23.5, but 23.4 degrees, or about halfway between its extremes. This angle is slowly decreasing in a cycle that spans about 41,000 years. It was last at its maximum tilt about 10,700 years ago, uh, and it'll reach its minimum tilt in about 9,800 years. So if we think what was about 10,700 years ago or so was our last glacial maximum. Well, a little bit longer ago than that, but uh, we see these shifts. So we are at an interglacial. The Holocene is an interglacial period, true, but uh, there are other things at play here. So as obliquity decreases, it gradually helps make our seasons milder, resulting in increasingly warmer winters and cooler summers that gradually, over time, allow snow and ice at the high latitudes to build up into large ice sheets. As ice cover increases, it reflects more of the sun's energy back, promoting even further cooling. It's kind of this positive feedback loop. Last one, precession. Uh, as Earth rotates, it wobbles slightly on its axis, like a slightly off-center top. The wobble is due to tidal forces caused by the gravitational influences of the Sun and Moon that cause Earth to bulge at the equator, affecting its rotation. The trend in direction of this wobble relative to the fixed positions of the stars is known as axial precession. The cycle of axial precession spans about between, I'll say, 23 and 25,000 years. Axial precession makes seasonal contrasts more extreme in one hemisphere and less extreme in the other. Current uh, perihelion occurs during winter in the northern hemisphere and summer in the southern hemisphere. This makes the southern, hummus, southern hemisphere, I almost said hemisphere, and now I'm kind of hungry. Uh, so <laughs> this makes southern hemisphere summers hotter and moderates northern hemisphere seasonal variations. However, in about 13,000 years, axial precession will cause these conditions to flip, with the northern hemisphere seeing more extremes in solar radiation and the southern, here, southern hemisphere experiencing more moderate seasonal variations. So we look at the Milinkovitch theory of climate change regarding glacial periods. Ice growth configuration is related to low eccentricity low tilt and large Earth-Sun distance in the Northern Hemisphere, the net effect is less seasonal contrast. In interglacial periods, ice growth configuration uh, is based on high eccentricity, high obliquity or tilt, and small Earth-Sun distance in Northern, Northern Hemisphere summers. There's more of a seasonal contrast. And we can see here, if you start overlaying these on top of one another, eccentricity, obliquity, and precision, or precession, pardon me, you get these new cycles that'll be created, these waves of patterns. And we've seen things like this before. When we looked at those uh, annual temperature back to you know, 800,000 years, 
800,000 years ago gives us eight of those eccentricity cycles, right? And there'd be 20 of those obliquity cycles and there'd be 40 plus of those precession cycles. So add all those together and you're seeing these dominant cyclicities or variations that are overlapping one another that occur that drive these variations in climate. What else causes natural changes in climate? Moving on from the Milankovitch stuff. Changes in the distribution of continents. As you have changes in where land and water are distributed, uh, distributed, pardon me, you have differences on where these global circulation patterns set up. What drives these global pressure, global temperature, global wind, and global current, ocean current climates. So when we were at Pangaea, very different than where we are now, very different than where we're going. So think about it, changes in the distribution of continents affect all of these different aspects. And we can see here, uh, just looking at uh, fossil remains of different species uh, that existed in Chile and Peru uh, that walked over to South Africa or uh, these fossils of ferns that were found in Antarctica and also found in southern India and across Africa and South America, uh, even into Australia. So we see these records of where things used to be distributed. And if we know where they used to be distributed, we can infer on what the climate must have been, this paleontological record of what the climate must have been when this was Pangaea or when this was uh, Gondwana or other supercontinents here, right? or where we are today. So if we know that ferns, which are, you know, temperate to tropical dwelling vegetation existed in Antarctica, or Antar Antarctica, Antarctica, sorry. Uh, we know the climate must have been different. This paleo climate wasn't what it is today. It wasn't this giant ice sheet at the Southern portion of the planet. It was something different. And that can infer on paleo climate proxies for us. Just looking back at some of our old uh, figures we've seen, this is average net daily radi radiation uh, at the top of the atmosphere. It wouldn't look like this if we were Pangaea. There would be a vastly different distribution of insulation. There would be a vastly different distribution of where our dominant currents are setting up or maybe where our thermal hailing cycles are uh, running from or where these dominant wind patterns and pressure patterns are setting up. We wouldn't have necessarily the Hadley cells maybe, or maybe we wouldn't have the intertropical convergence zone where it is. And then uh, another big one, and this kind of feeds into some of the others, changes in atmospheric content of greenhouse gases. So here's that figure again. We're looking on the top, carbon dioxide, and the bottom, methane, in the middle, temperature anomalies. So as these variations occur, and we see, and we start to see some of these cycles, thinking back to Milankovitch, as we see some of these cycles occurring, you have warmer climates, more plant life, more carbon sunk versus less carbon sunk, uh, more methane being produced versus less methane being produced. There are all these variations that allow us, if we can get at what those concentrations were back in the day, can tell us about uh, how they drove paleoclimates at the time. Here we can see there's glacial interglacial periods. We're in the Holocene now, uh, kind of this interglacial period. And we kind of see how these variations have occurred. So Wisconsin glaciation being our last dip uh, where methane and carbon dioxide both dipped down because they were locked up uh, under ice. And now they are where they, well, they were naturally where they were, and then the Industrial Revolution kind of kicked into gear, and we see where we were as of 2009. Not necessarily great. So now we're going to introduce paleoclimate. And this is where we're going to end this video here in the next number of slides, nine slides here. So paleoclimate is a word that means ancient climates. In other words, it's the branch of science that deals with studying Earth's climate from prehistoric times. Paleoclimatologists approach their work with two tools 
First, they have a solid understanding of the way the world works today. That is biogeochemical cycles, the idea of reservoirs for carbon, for instance, and fluxes that move carbon from re reservoir to what reservoir. This theoretical understanding allows them to focus on certain kinds of physical evidence, stuff that records the climatic conditions of the past as a sort of signature. These physical signatures that hint at ancient climates are what we call proxies. We would love to have an actual thermometer from the late Paleozoic, but until somebody gets at time travel uh, and the paradoxes around time travel, we're not going to get that. So the proxy data is a kind of clue that paleoclimatologists can use to deduce what the temperature must have been. Why do we want to do this? Because we need to make an incontrovertible case about the role that humans play in global warming. You can use it for other purposes, um, just to infer for scientific discourse in general. But at the end of the day, we are faced with a global problem, and that is global climate change, anthropogenic climate change. What do scientists need to make an incontrovertible case? A long-term temperature record, centuries in the making, over a large portion of the globe so that we can say, and I say we, you and I, scientists, what is the average and what has the average been for several hundred years? And are what we're experiencing now a significant departure from that? And as James Treffel, physicist says, it's very difficult to do. So how do we do it? Well, let's look at this dragonfly, all right? How could a dragonfly tell us about the climate of the ancient past? Well, modern climate's tricky because uh, it is such a complicated and complex system as you have been learning this whole semester. The same is true for paleoclimate, which is even more complicated because we don't have anything there to measure it directly. However, some basic principles guide the work that paleoclimatologists do. Consider this diagram uh, by C. Bentley. Um, I linked their stuff here at the end of the video. Uh, all of these last uh, number of slides were from them. Um, a fantastic presentation that I was able to use for all of you. But consider this diagram, which shows the relationship between two atmospheric gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. They exchange atoms of matter with other reservoirs, such as vegetation on Earth's surface and fossil fuels below Earth's surface. The weathering of coal releases carbon dioxide for existence, in, in, for instance. The CO2 goes to the atmosphere. There it can be captured by plants as they undergo photosynthesis. Photosynthesis releases oxygen to the atmosphere. The resulting plant matter could rot or decompose, or it could be buried. If it decomposes, the carbon goes back into the atmosphere. To do this, it reacts with the oxygen and uh, the C and the O2 give you carbon dioxide. If it gets buried instead, the carbon goes underground and becomes coal. Only later, it's exposed at the surface, and then it can react with uh, oxygen again to make carbon dioxide. So, what that says is if the process of burial were to increase in importance, how would the rest of the system respond? So, if more burial was more important, how would the rest of, of the system respond? So, take a second to pause and think about that. Um, but I'll go ahead and continue here. So as more vegetation carbon is buried, less carbon is returned to the atmosphere. Therefore, there is less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the oxygen produced by photosynthesis or the O2 actually remains. Overall, we would expect this to trigger a cooling of the climate due to lesser strength of our greenhouses, our greenhouse gases, our greenhouse effect here, and to produce an atmosphere enriched in oxygen a lot of burial of plant matter happened in the late Paleozoic era of geologic time, uh, the Carbon Carboniferous period and the Permian period as well. Rapid sea level rise and fall repeatedly buried coastal vegetation. Think of the bayous of Louisiana, the Everglades, Everglades of uh, Florida, under shallow marine limestone. Shallow seas repeatedly flooded the middle of the North American continent. These seas sealed off thousands of billions of tons of vegetation, making the Carboniferous a well-named period, a time of tremendous natural carbon sequestration. So let's go back to our dragonfly and think about this situation. How would it have affected her?
Well, the more oxygen there is in the air, the larger that dragonfly could become. Some dragonflies from the late Paleozoic era, like the Meganura, have a wingspan of almost a meter. Think of the dragonflies you see in summer in Eau Claire, They're like that big. We're talking a meter, half of me, <laughs> um, or just over half of me. Science fiction aside, um, insects do not get to be this big today because the oxygen content of our air, about 21%, is too low. Estimates are that the extraordinary burial of plant carbon during the Carboniferous jacked up atmospheric oxygen levels to an all-time high around 35%. This super oxygen-rich air was a necessary precondition for the evolution of giant lungless arthropods like the Meganura. I don't want to see those flying around me, but I definitely want nice, clean air. <laughs> um, insects breathe through spiracles small openings on the side of their abdomen that lead to a network of branching tubes through their body. Sometimes you might see a large insect like a dragonfly or grasshopper or praying mantis visibly pumping its abdomen. This is to increase the amount of air that circulates through its spiracles. This is a much less efficient method of breathing than lungs. The high surface area of our lungs allows us to survive in oxygen levels that would kill Meganura, the giant dragonfly. So this isn't a lesson in insect anatomy. The point is that the fossil of an enormously large dragonfly implies a certain oxygen level. That oxygen level can only be understood in the context of the carbon cycle, and it implies a tremendous amount of buried carbon at the same time that that dragonfly was alive. Indeed, there's a lot of coal uh, from that very time in the late Paleozoic, so all of this ties together. In summary, or paleoclimatologists use theory based in the laws of physics and relationships that we observe in our contemporary climates coupled with evidence from the ancient past or proxy data uh, to arrive at interpretations of past climates. As with all scientific conclusions, these interpretations are subject to falsification. They can be proved wrong if new data is introduced or new theories are introduced, but either our understanding of our evidence can upset these conclusions or form new ones. So we look here, things like isotopes in tree rings, cave deposits, corals, old shorelines and sediments, all of these things we can use to infer on our past climates. And that's what we use them for. We use these proxy data sets to connect the dots and connect the record in our past climates. We're gonna talk about a few of them in the next three videos. Dendrochronology, the study of tree rings and growth patterns, ice cores, uh, which can preserve paleoclimate indicators corresponding to the time of deposition in little tiny bubbles within the ice. Lake cores and pollen, which can inform on past depositional climates and dominant plant types. As we mentioned before, if you knew that a fern was existing in central Antarctica, sorry, my dog is going a little crazy here. Give it a second. Uh, if you know that a fern existed in southern in the central Antarctica, you know that it wasn't always a frigid ice sheet. Other ones that we're not gonna talk about, radiocarbon, uh, optically stimulated luminescence, potassium argon, speleothem data, and coral data. So we're not gonna talk about those, but just know that they exist and feel free to research if you are interested. That's where we're gonna wrap it up for this video. Uh, here are the references I use. Make sure you check those out um, if you're interested in learning more. I hope you enjoyed that video and I will see you in the next one. We're gonna talk about dendrochronology or tree ring studies. So enjoy, have a great day.